welcome to a very special edition of The Piano Men with Stanley Carr. We've got a very special guest joining me on the phone tonight. He is legendary singer-songwriter and a good friend of mine, Gene Cotton. Gene has recorded 15 albums and has had numerous hit singles over the years. He's appeared on Dick Clark's American Bandstand, The Midnight Special, the BBC's Top of the Pops, VH1, and other TV specials. He has also scored the music for numerous films, and his songs have been on several Grammy-nominated projects. Gene was the first recipient of the Harry Chapin Award for his advocacy on behalf of world hunger and other humanitarian efforts. His album Save the Dancer contains such classics as Before My Heart Finds Out, You're a Part of Me, a duet with Kim Carnes, and Like a Sunday in Salem, which held the number two slot on the National FM Singles Chart for more than two months. A native of Columbus, Ohio, and a political science major at Ohio State University, Cotton presently lives near the Nashville area in Leapers Fork. Tennessee. An avowed environmentalist, he has been involved in numerous preservation and conservation issues worldwide and is a past recipient of the Conservationist of the Year Award presented by the National Wildlife Federation. Cotton is the founder of the Nicaragua Project, a nonprofit organization that provides medical and school supplies to clinics and schools in Nicaragua. The organization also helps to provide scholarships for elementary, high school, and college students, as well as building and rehabbing schools and developing self-sustainability projects. Cotton is also one of the originators of Kids on Stage, a visual and performing arts program that is part of the core curriculum at Hillsborough School in Leapers Fork, Tennessee. The program sponsors a one-week summer academy whose mission is to provide world-class experiences in the visual and performing arts that, through process, performances, and production, empower students to be self-disciplined, lifelong learners. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Stanley, and it's good to be with you, and uh, I have fond memories of when you were uh, going to Kids on Stage many, many, <laughs> many years ago. It's definitely been a long time coming. Tell me about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, and I grew up in a very poor neighborhood, and uh, I was uh, hanging out with all the wrong people. And, um, you know, I got myself in a lot of trouble, spent some time in juvenile hall. And I think it was when I was 13 years old, uh, one of my older brothers bought me a guitar for Christmas. It was, he came from a pawn shop and I'll never forget the sticker inside. It said, buy a pick for 1999, get a guitar free, you know, so, um, and uh, it, it's been, uh, it's been, you know, that was the beginning of, of turning around my life. I think you know, I, I got involved in music, and that was the era of folk music, Bob Dylan, and uh, Peter Paul and Mary, and all that whole Woody Guthrie and that whole folk movement and protest movement, and uh, just took my life in a whole different direction. And, and had it not been for that, I'm, I, it literally would save my life. Absolutely, that no doubt about that. Did you grow? So you mentioned you had a brother. Did you have any other siblings? Oh yes, we were a family of nine. Wow, nine nine children, I should say. <laughs> My uh, uh, there were there were six boys and three girls. And when people would ask my dad how many kids he had, he always would say three and a half dozen. Wow. Which was true. Three and a half dozen is nine, you know. So. <laughs> yep. So you decided to become a musician, and you were influenced by the likes of Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan. Who else were some of your favorites growing up? Well, Woody Guthrie, of course, you know, Pete Seeger, and, uh, and a, a lot of the artists who were, uh, uh, you know, performing and writing protest songs. And you began your career in 1974 after signing with, is it Mir Records, M Y R H H. Well, actually, I did an album on my own uh, in Nashville, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and somebody heard it and wanted to buy the master from me. It was Mir Records. Mir Records. And they bought the master from me, 
and they started getting some airplay in L.A. And Murr Records, which is a small Texas label, had never uh, had never had a major hit or had never been in the big league. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they when they went to Billboard magazine to take out an ad, they were told it was seventy five hundred dollars. I don't think Murr Records ever spent seventy five hundred dollars <laughs> on anything, <laughs> and. Uh, and so they just they just weren't capable, and uh, the president of ABC Records uh, had heard my music being played on a station in in, in uh, Los Angeles, and he he called his A and R department and he said, "Go find this guy and sign him." Mm-hmm. So and that was kind of the way it went. You know, they bought my contract from Mer Records and. I signed with ABC and had a few hits with them, and 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 then things kind of went sour with ABC, and I signed with Areola, and, and we had Before My Heart Finds Out, and that's several mm-hmm. other, you know, songs that got significant airplay. So, it's I've had a lot of fun. I, I've done a lot of things that I never thought I would ha- ever have gotten to do, and I'm ever so grateful for the people and the fans who. Uh, in fact, I got a letter today, uh, a guy thanking me for my music. And I mean, it's always great to hear from people who uh, you know who have an appreciation for who you are and what you've done and uh, and what it has meant to their lives. So I'm just ever grateful for those fans out there who've kept me alive all these years. Definitely well said. As you mentioned, you signed with ABC Records and you achieved some of your greatest successes with singles like Before My Heart Finds Out, You Got Me Run, and, and Like a Sunday in Salem, which we're going to hear in a little bit. Can you describe what it felt like getting these hits on the Billboard Top 40 charts? Well, I can tell you back in 1974, I was driving down Interstate 24 towards Murfreesboro, and it was... Uh, Late, late at night, and and when it got dark, you could hear stations from other states. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And and I was listening to I think it was uh, WLS, not WLS. It was a big station out of Chicago. I can't remember the name, but the uh, disc disc jockey's name was I think it was Dick Biondi. And uh, and he he said, here's a new song right now from uh, called Sunshine Roses from Gene Cotton. <laughs> and I went, whoa, what the heck, you know? But it was fading in and out. And so I remember pulling off the interstate, you know, into the grass and trying to maneuver my car so I could get the best signal <laughs> to listen to it. Because it was actually the first time I'd actually heard one of my songs you know, on a big radio, major league radio station. Wow. And uh, and I, I finally was able to get my car pointed in the right direction where I got a, <laughs> it wasn't a great signal, but it was a halfway decent signal. And they had all these, like you said, they had all these clear channel radio stations like WLS and WSM and all those, all those uh, signals, all those radio stations that people could pick up in different parts of the country. So we're gonna sure. go. We're gonna go ahead and play like a Sunday in Salem. What can you tell me about this song? Well, I wrote the song in less than fifteen minutes, and I looked at the lyrics and I said to myself, "What the heck is this a song about?" And then, you know, you know how these things kind of float through your head. You mm-hmm. know, these ideas and uh, and all of a sudden, I realized, you know, it, it was it was about my political science major at, at Ohio State University, and studying the era of um, Senator Joe, Joe McCarthy and the McCarthy hearings and the black ball, uh, you know, uh, listings of all the actors and musicians who couldn't get work during that time, and so that's really what the song is about that 
It says Amos and Andy on the radio. Amos mm-hmm. and Andy was on the radio back in the 50s. So mm-hmm. it's it's one of those time reference songs. So we're going to go ahead and play Like a Sunday in Salem. This is The Piano Man with Stanley Carr. All right. We're back here on The Piano Men. We're speaking with singer-songwriter Gene Cotton tonight about his illustrious career. Following the release of Save the Dancer in 1978, you won Arola's Most Charted Artist Award and was voted one of Cashbox Magazine's top three male vocalists in 1979. During the early part of your career, do you want to share a memory or two of when you released certain songs that made you realize, hey, I made it? Well, I, I remember uh, early on when I released uh, my first album on, I should say, when ABC released my first album on ABC, they called me on a Wednesday and they said, uh, we've got the uh, Livy Newton, Livy Newton John tour for you opening for her it starts on monday uh you do have a band don't you and i went oh of course i have a band i got a great band and so they gave me all the details and everything of course i didn't have a band at all you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so i i just called up some studio player friends of mine that i'd worked with and had known for years here in nashville and they thought it'd be kind of fun to go out on the road. And, you know, Libby Newton John was just starting to happen, and this was was her first uh, American tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I arranged for three rehearsals between Wednesday and Sunday, and we were leaving on Monday, uh, flying out. I think it was the first date was it was in uh, Asheville, mm-hmm. uh, North Carolina. And uh, it was interesting uh, because nobody showed up for all three of the rehearsals. Uh, Two people showed up for one, and two other people showed up for one, one person showed up for one, and and the drummer never showed up for any of them. (laughs) But these guys were all pro musicians. Uh, The drummer was Kenny Buttrey. Kenny Buttrey was... Just a legendary musician. He was, uh, he played uh, drums with uh, Neil Young on his Heart of Gold album. Mm -hmm. And he played with, uh, I mean, he played with so many major artists. And my keyboard player was Shane Keister. And Shane was just such an amazing player. Uh, And he played on everybody from Elvis to, um, Oh, he did all the England Dan, John Ford Coley records. And my guitar player was Steve Gibson, who was probably one of the top uh, session players in Nashville at the time, and and still is. Uh, in, in my estimation, he's one of the top ten uh, guitar players in the world. I mean, he's just an amazing guitarist. And on bass was, I think it was Norbert Putnam, who uh, owned Quadraphonic Sound Studios and produced Dan Fogelberg, and he produced that Joan Baez single, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Mm -hmm. And so these guys were like legendary players, so I I really wasn't worried at all. Uh, Kenny Buttrey, who showed up for none of the rehearsals, uh, sat next to me on the plane, and I was telling him how each song started and what the tempo was and everything and how it ended and how many choruses there were and a bridge, if there was one, that kind of thing. And Olivia Newton-John, this was the first night, and she took so long with her sound check that we didn't get a sound check. They just put our stuff out there and put mics in front of it and Hope it, hope it was going to work. And if you remember back in those days, uh, this was pre-CDs, uh, liner notes meant so much to everybody. Mm-hmm. When you bought an album, you know, you opened it up and you wanted to see who played on the session. 
and who the musicians were, and who produced it, who were the engineers, where it was recorded. All of that you know, information was important. And so they introduced us, and we ran out on stage. And it was so funny, because Kenny Buttry, the drummer, he, he said to me, now, how does this first song go? I went, Kenny, I'm going to count it off, and from there on, you're going to take it. <laughs> and so I counted it off. One, two, three, and boom. And it, it, it had been just like we've been playing for 20 years together. Because so these guys were just top pros. And all of a sudden, I noticed that Olivia's band was standing in the wings watching us play. And the reason was that her band was from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota except for her lead guitar player and uh, band director, uh, John Farrar. He was from England. And and they were all standing out there because, I mean, these guys were were, music, were really good musicians, and they, know, they knew who these people were. And I think they were trying to figure out, how does an opening act get Kenny Buttry and Shane Keister and Steve Gibson and Norbert Putnam, you know, for his band, you know, it just, it was so funny. And we walked off and after we played and we got an encore, came back on, played an encore. And as we were running off stage, uh, John Farrar, uh, Olivia's uh, band leader and lead guitar player, uh, he was talking with uh, Kenny Buttry. And he says, man, he said, that was just fantastic. He said, how long have you guys been together? And Kenny Buttry looked at his watch and he said, 45 minutes, you know, which was, mm-hmm. which was literally the truth. You know, we had been together 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. But it was an amazing uh, tribute to the quality of the, uh, you know, studio players here in Nashville. Mm-hmm. I was watching uh, one of your... Uh interviews that you did on American Bandstand, and I believe Dick Clark asked you, what kind of music do you play, or what or what kind of, describe the kind of music that you play. He wasn't sure if you were doing rock, pop, or country. What, can you tell me, in a couple words, what what do you feel your music is? Well, it, my, my music has folk roots, and always has, and always will be. But, as as that music goes, you know, sometimes it crosses over into pop and and, and uh, uh, rock music. So it really, it, 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 my music really traverses, you know, a, a number of genres of music, but it's definitely rooted in folk. And you also moved to Leaper's Fork around the late 70s. What made you decide to make the move? Well, we had lived in Nashville uh, from 1969 until about 1976. And my management company was in L.A. My record company was in L.A. Uh, William Morris, my agency, was in L.A. And they all kept saying, you got to move out here. you got to move out here. you got to have a presence out here. And so we sold our house in Nashville and moved to L.A. for about two years, enjoyed that about as much as we could stand, and uh, moved back to uh, to Tennessee. And as fate would have it, uh, I just inadvertently, you know, found this property out here in Leaper's Fort, and it was 35 acres, and it was $600 an acre, and it was like a car payment for five years, and it was done and over with. But what was amazing is the uh, the transition over the. I guess it probably started in, in the uh, mid mid eight eighties to late eighties. You know, Tony Joe White moved out here, um, and, and there any any number of musicians uh, were moving out here. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, and it was just a great place to live, and and all of a sudden, you know, people started taking notice. I, I think a lot of it was 
some of the renovation of, of the homes that was going on. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, uh, our, we formed an, org an organization called the Southwest Williamson County Community Association. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that organization was formed for many reasons, but one of the main reasons was to uh, fight uh, 840 coming through the southwest of Williamson County, the way it was coming through. Mm -hmm. I believe even Justin Timberlake has a house in Leapers Fork. <laughs> Justin Timberlake? Yep. Michael McDonald lived here. I think he's moved back to... Either California or Hawaii, one or the other. Wow. Um, and John Kay from Steppenwolf uh, lived out here for a number of years. I was over at his house one day, and I saw all these boxes, and I said, John, what's going on with all these boxes? And uh, he said, well, he said, we're moving to uh, Vancouver. I said, Vancouver? He said, yep. He said, we decided that if uh, Bush got elected again, we were moving to Canada. Oh, man. <laughs> so <clears throat> he and his wife, Yuta, moved to Canada. So, But there are still a number of artists and producers and writers out here. Uh, it's a, They call Leapers Fork the Malibu of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in Malibu, California, has just tons of artists and uh, television stars, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really what Leapers Fork has become here. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I guess while we're on this note of talking about people, I'll, I'm going to throw out a few names of artists that you've worked with. And if you can tell me what it was like to work with them, we'll start with Kim Carnes. Well, Kim Carnes is just an incredible artist and a great songwriter. And uh, she and her husband are just wonderful, wonderful, decent human beings. You couldn't ask for uh, better people to be around. They really are uh, salt of the earth people and uh, and and just just great people. No, <laughs> no doubt about that. Michael Johnson. Well, Michael, is, it's interesting. My brother-in-law called me in the early 70s and said, have you ever heard of Michael Johnson? And I said, I don't think so. He said, oh, man, you got to hear his music. I'm going to send you his album. And he sent me his album, and I was just absolutely blown away. Mm. In fact, I was uh, working on an album at the time, and I said, I, I got to record this, this. There was one song called There Is a Breeze on the album that my brother-in-law sent me. And I said, I got to record that song. And so I called his manager and I said, would you have a problem with me recording that? I mean, I don't want to record it if he's going to you know, release it as a single or if he's got plans for it. And they said, no, no, they'd love to have me record it. And so... His manager was uh, Keith Christensen, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were out of Minneapolis, and uh, we got to be good phone friends. Mm -hmm. And then he came to town to uh, promote a few songwriters and artists that he was representing. Uh, one which was I don't know if you remember Mary McGregor, who had the hit "Torn Between Two Lovers." That name seems familiar. It, and she and her husband lived lived at our house in Nashville for almost two years oh. while she was, you know, getting her career going. And then Michael Johnson would come through from time to time and stay at our house. And Michael, I guess the way to describe Michael is he was the absolute best singer, songwriter, guitar player in the world. Uh, I've never heard anybody who played uh, as impeccable as, as he did. He was he was just utterly amazing. And, and uh, what a voice he had. And unfortunately, he passed away way too soon. Mm -hmm. So, and there have been a lot of different artists. I know uh, uh, P. 
Peter Yarrow from Peter, Paul, and Mary, he called me up one day and he said, I've got a session that I've got to do in Nashville and, uh, and Keith Christensen told me that you knew all these great musicians. And I said, yeah, I do. He said, I want you to set me up a session. And so we, I set there a series of sessions. Uh, and so I did, and uh, he stayed at our house, and uh, we did all the work at Creative Workshop, which was Buzz Kaysen's, you know, baby. And uh, and stuff turned out great. It was never a hit off of it. It was the United Artists Act, and it, they never, you know, just never quite got it together. Uh, I mean, they, they got some airplay. And they were able to tour off of uh, the, of that airplay, mm -hmm. but they never became a major act like they should have. And last but not least, uh, Barbara Bailey Hutchinson. Barbara Bailey Hutchinson is a Grammy Award winning singer songwriter, and we have been friends since I don't know, probably the late seventies, early eighties. And, in fact, I did a live album at uh, Tennessee Tech, uh, which will always be one of my favorite places to play. And uh, Kim Carnes couldn't make it in, and so I asked Barbara, and she was up somewhere in the uh, northeast playing in, in Connecticut, Massachusetts, I don't know. New England area. So, some, somewhere up there, and uh, and she had the date off, and so we flew her in, and she sang that song with me on the on that live at Tennessee Tech album. Wow! And a great person. Mm -hmm. uh, she and her husband really are. You know, it's, it's it's like Kim Carnes and her husband Dave. I mean, they're just Barbara and Chris are just super super people. Couldn't be nicer to work with. Very kind. Very kind. So we're going to transition to Sail Out Onto the Ocean. It's from your 1993 release, The Edge Hill Fi File. More with Gene Cotton after this. All right. And we're back on The Piano Men talking with singer-songwriter Gene Cotton Gene, tell me a little bit about the songwriting process. What is the first thing that comes to mind for you when writing a song? Well, you know, I'm unlike most songwriters because I know uh, a lot of songwriters in Nashville. I was uh, president for, or vice president for four years of uh, AFTRA, which is American Federation of Radio and Television. Artists and Screen Actors Guild, uh, and then I was president for uh, four years. Wow. And in the process of those eight years, we developed a program where uh, songwriters could be a part of AFTRA and uh, and reap the benefits, the medical benefits and some of the other benefits of, of, of being a member of AFTRA. So I got to know a lot of the songwriters. And um, the a lot, a lot of the songwriters, I mean, I, I know Don Schlitz pretty well. And Don, you know, he's got a meeting at 10 to write. He's got a meeting at 11 to write. Uh, He'll go to lunch maybe and start writing at one with somebody else and two with some, and they write with all these different people and I've never been able to write like that. I just I I the way I look at it, there's this sphere of 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 creativity that's around us, and every once in a while something passes through, mm -hmm. and if you grab it quick enough and write it down, you, you might have a song. And so that's kind of the way I've, I, I have, have written, you know, uh, most of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times when I'm inspired by something that happened 
uh, like my wife came home one day. Uh, she's a school teacher, and she was telling me that she, and she, 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 at the time she taught third grade, and she was telling me that she had a high school uh, student come in who was from China and read a familiar nursery rhyme uh, that you know that they that they knew in English. And as, as they do in Chinese, they start from the back of the book and read mm-hmm. forward. And one of the first questions that was asked when he was finished reading was, how, how come he, he read it wrong? And my wife, who is so wise, uh, said, well, th- was it wrong or was it just different? And I was in the middle of cooking dinner. And I said to my wife, as soon as she said that, I said, you got to finish cooking dinner. I got to go write this down. So I went and wrote this song called Different From You. Mm-hmm. And it, it will be the title of my next album that I'm working on now. That's great. So, there, you know, it comes different ways. You know, you just, you never know. You, you, you feel something. You see something happen. Uh, you, you catch this thing that passes by you, you know, in this sphere of creativity. There there are a lot of different ways that songs come. And most songs seem to be very romantic and personal. You are passionate about many things, and one of the many things you're passionate about is helping people, and especially young artists. In 1996, you helped start the Kids on Stage Summer Academy in Leapers Fork, which I'm very proud to be an alum of. And that was started in Hillsborough School in Leapers Fork. Tell me, Gene, how did Kids on Stage ca- come about, and what was your involvement with it? Well, the short Reader's Digest version is that there were there was a place out there called Ernie's Smokehouse, and it was at what is now known as Green's Grocery. <laughs> Excuse me. I guess it's always been known as Green's Grocery. Uh, but Ernie called it Ernie's Smokehouse, and he had barbecue. And uh, we were sitting around just talking about the school in our community and how low the test scores were. And there was this incredible guy named Aubrey Preston who uh, kind of organized it and went out and got the test scores and and they were horrible compared to everywhere else in the county. And so we decided that uh, between us, all of us musicians who were in the conversation, that we had enough gear that we could put together a band or two. And we figured, you know, nothing would excite a band uh, or excite a school more than having a, you know, a good couple of rock and roll bands in their school. You know, you get up on stage, you get applause, self-esteem might make a better student. And little did we know that uh, all of the national research that's been done uh, points to the fact that kids who have uh, music and art in their core curriculum do better at everything. They, they're better students. They Their, their scores, their ACT scores are higher. Uh, on the average, uh, and they just do better in life. And so we we started this program, and it turned out just to be this incredible program where they uh, uh, they, they infuse the whole visual, performing, and technical arts into the core curriculum of the school. And then every summer for two weeks, we did a, a summer academy. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's and so many people have come through the program. Miley Cyrus, uh, the band Paramore. Uh, I mean, just so many people. And a lot of people who are now out touring as players with a lot of, you know, various artists, country artists, pop mm-hmm. artists, uh, you know, rock and roll artists, uh, and people who are in the technical arts doing sound and lighting who've come through that program. So it's been a real asset to the, you know, to the entertainment industry sure. uh, here in Nashville. 
And look at how it's evolved, too, because now you've got the Chinese kids coming to America for a special kids on stage program. We do. We have a partnership with the uh, government of China, and they send about 50 kids every year. We're right now uh, talking with them. Uh, it may not happen this year because of the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's just too uh, risky, uh, you know, to have that many kids coming from the area where this virus is. But yeah, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen by summer? You know, it may be, you know, a, a, a dead issue by that time. Never say never, Gene. Absolutely. You're also the founder of the Nicaragua Project, and you also help provide supplies in addition to constructing new schools and medical facilities in the country. What made you want to start this organization up? Well, I went down there uh, 32 years ago uh, with a group of kids from our church in Nashville, Edge Hill United Methodist Church. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and actually what happened is the youth came up from Sunday school uh, at the end of the service one morning and announced that they were going to Nicaragua next year. And uh, I raised my hand and I said, uh, do you all know that there's a war going on down there? And they said, yes, but we're going anyway. And two of the kids who said they were going were, were our kids. So <laughs> I decided, well, I, I probably should go down as an adult supervisor just to make sure my kids are okay. <laughs> And so I fell in love with the country, with the people, and I've been going back every year since. I just, in fact, just got back uh, a couple of days ago from a two-week trip. Uh, uh, I had a group of uh, students from Northern California that I took down and have been taking down for about the past, I don't know, eight, ten years. And, uh, and they worked on the school while we were down there. And I really believe that education is the answer, you know, to uh, poverty and to uh, a country who finds itself a, a, a third world country. Uh, education definitely is the answer. Uh, unfortunately, right now, Daniel Ortega, who fought 40 years ago against the uh, Sandinista, I mean, against the uh, Samosa regime uh, uh, under the uh, umbrella of the Sandinista movement. And unfortunately, 40 years later, he's become the very thing that he fought against 40 years ago. You know, mm-hmm. that old adage that absolute power corrupts is, is mm-hmm. so true. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about I know you said you were working on a new CD. What, what's next for you? Well, you never know. I'm out, you know, I'm always out playing, you know, mostly. Uh, I used to do it's a ton of college concerts. I don't think there's hardly a, a college in the United States that I haven't played at one time or another. Yeah. Uh, but I mainly play, you know, community concert series and fine art series and that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, And I'm working on actually several albums at the same time. So, uh, and hopefully they will be released sometime mid to late summer. How would you like to be remembered? I'm sorry? How would you like to be remembered? How would I like to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as someone who cared about things and, uh, and not only cared about things, but did something about those things that I cared about. Well, you're always somebody that cares about people, and that's the good uh, Samaritan you are. Do you have any advice to anybody that does that wants to go into the music business? And do you feel that it's changed any in the last 20 years? Well, certainly the music business has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, from the digital digital age, uh, from analog. Uh, and uh, I, I remember, oh, 
few years ago. We have a godson who lives in Iowa, and uh, so my wife and I went up for his uh, high school graduation, mm-hmm. and he had a party at his house, and I had brought my guitar, and they asked me to play a few songs, and <clears throat> they said, so here's somebody here who plays songs, and I said, who? And this guy raised his hand, and they handed him my guitar. And he started playing these songs, which were really, really good songs. And I said, what are you going to do with your life? He said, well, I want to be in the music business, uh, but my parents want me to go to college. And I said, well, my advice is the music business is done basically in three places, New York, Nashville, and L.A. There are obviously little pockets, you know, like Minneapolis has a music scene, you know, Seattle, mm-hmm. Muscle Souls, Atlanta, other Miami. Austin. But they're nothing like, you know, Nashville, New York, and L.A. Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but Nashville does more recording sessions than all other cities put together in the United States. That's just... It's, a, it's amazing. It's an amazing... Uh, uh, figure. I mean, it's, it's just huge. Uh, but this uh, guy who played these songs for me, he sent me some songs, oh, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks later when I got home. Sent me a CD of the songs, and they were good. And I told him, I said, if I were you, I'd either, if I, if I had to go to school, I'd either be going to school in New York, Nashville, or, or L.A., and I said, if I had my preference, it would be either L.A. or Nashville. Well, I don't know. It was three months later, four months later. Uh, this guy's name is Jason Reeves. Mm. And all of a sudden, he has the number one song in the world. And it's, it's uh, it was uh, one he did with Kobe Collette. Kobe Collette? Kobe Collette, yeah. yes. Uh, called Bubbly. Mm -hmm. And I I just, I I, I was so happy for him that he had done what his heart was telling him to do. Definitely. Definitely. And the rest is history. But, you know, and that song actually started out as an internet hit at first. Uh, it was not a rec- he, they were not signed to a record deal and and that's that's the good thing about YouTube and some of the other places where you can put up your music you know for streaming sure. and get your music out there and build a, a fan base and before you know it you get yourself a record deal somewhere well speaking of websites and social media is there anywhere that people can find your music like iTunes or Spotify or where can people find your music, Gene? Yeah, it's it's on all those places. That's good. And I do remember something you taught us in songwriting class. Do well in English class. That's right. Do well in English class. Well, Gene, it's it's been a real privilege uh, having you on the show tonight. Your life and accomplishments are truly inspirational. Just want to thank you for spending this hour with me. Please come back anytime. Maybe come back on live in the studio. I would. I I will be live the next time, Stanley. And I gotta I gotta tell you, Stanley, I I, I you don't know how proud I am of you of watching you. As a what? What were you? Twelve, thirteen years old when you first started coming to Kids on Stage? I believe I was and, eleven when I started Kids on Stage. Eleven, and uh, and to watch you uh, through the years and develop, and uh, and now you have this great radio show, and you're doing such a great job, and uh, I couldn't be prouder. So there you go, my friend. Take care. Thank you, Gene. I appreciate it. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. We're gonna, bye. We're going to close this out with Tightrope Walker from Gene Cotton. Well, that's it for The Piano Men with Stanley Carr. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Radio Show. I'll see you next week.